think mine's on. Can you hear me? Second. Yeah, no. <laughs> Hi, I'm Carrie, and this is Bill. Bill. Um, we're going to talk today about um, our general design process and highlight a couple of projects, uh, B-Side 6 one being one of those, and our workforce housing project um, being the second. Um, going through an introduction about how we approach design um, and sustainability um, as a basis. Did you just like that? Do you have images in there first? Okay. <laughs> um, it, we've been working on kind of the statement of how to talk about our process and how it differs from other firms um, and other processes. Um, it's about distilling factual and conceptual information as a catalyst for design and conceptualization. So we, we thought we'd just start with a few images that we look at a lot. Um, they kind of come up in our process. Um, uh, quite a bit, and they're, a lot of times they're sort of jumping off points to either sort of inspire a process, inspire a methodology, inspire a texture. So these are just a few that have actually, I mean, they, we've got a whole catalog, but these, these kind of keep coming up. And they'll deal with uh, both, you know, textures that are sort of found in nature that can talk about overlapping or light, um, and also um, at times, uh, a manufactured process that actually achieves a similar idea. That's you. <laughs> Talk a little bit about sustainability in, in our practice. Um, and we very much, we have this idea that it's just sustainability the old-fashioned way. There's a lot of people talking about green building these days. And what we like to do is just kind of strip it back to the basics. Um, and I don't typically do this, but I'm actually going to read a little bit when we go through the next <laughs> slides. The thing about the, the projects that, that um, we've had the opportunity to work on is we don't have huge budgets. And a lot of times, I mean, I, I know there's a whole dialogue about how sustainable practices and um, green building don't actually cost money. But in the end, a lot of the more sophisticated strategies do. So we try to kind of keep it simple. So the first thing to always approach is just thinking about the site and the building. Sure. It's being on. The building is always cited in response to this environment, and whether that happens to be an urban environment or nestled into the landscape. Um, but the building facade and how it's cited, um, it's, it always has to deal with the environmental conditions of sun and wind and rain. The other concept is less material is more sustainable. And this, it does come from a direct result of our budgets are, are usually fairly small. But design and resulting construction can be refined to, down to its essence. Ornament is minimalistic in nature and exposed structure components and simple finishes recycled in sustainable materials. Look to avoid covering one material with another. The idea of outside in. Building occupants which have access to operable windows and shared outdoor spaces. Encourage tenants to utilize opportunities for fresh air. Floor to ceiling glazing where appropriate allows daylight to reach deep into the space, creating opportunities for views to the world outside. And the promise of technology. Wherever possible, buildings should look to reduce energy consumption through judicious use of new technologies. Lighting and conditioning systems have become smart. Glass and glazing, glazing systems have become sophisticated, and insulating building envelopes have become refined. So kind of getting to um, our process and how things have sort of evolved, um, we often look to um, some analogous structure, some analogous image, um, some analogous concept to actually dictate our buildings, whether it's, it's sort of a project at the end of the Morrison Bridge and looking at that structure as um, sort of uh, uh, an example of, of a very pragmatic um, technology and how that actually adapts into um, a facade system that screens the west side and actually um, talks about a structure that sun shades from the south. Um, it's a project up on Mississippi where we were dealing with 
um, a, a higher density building in a neighborhood of older structures and how we could actually take some of those structures and talk about um, a frontage park that, that was site specific and how that begins to actually shift the building. Um, also looking at sort of historic concepts of how uh, frame and volume can actually interact. Um, this project actually looked at how we could get um, through ventilation, sort of larger uh, work live spaces with through uh, ventilation all the way through the building. Um, whether it's, it's building specific, um, the Olympic Mills project, which um, you alluded to, uh, was actually a, 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 a grain elevator. So there were all of these structures uh, within it, this kind of idea of liner and frame um, with uh, the, uh, the existing grain cribs and how we actually took out um, the wood from the floor structure of the building, actually remilled it and, and, and looked at an architecture that dealt with the sort of liner and frame. And then uh, whether it's also a kind of a tactile idea um, about force in a project, um, a theater project that we were working on, which um, was on a very constricted site, um, had a ramp system up the front because we were trying to get out of using an elevator, um, and how the sense of a mass of people inside the volume of the building might actually start to give it uh, expression. Um, so like we mentioned, we're going to focus on two of the projects that we've been working on in the office, B-Side 6, which was recently completed in May, um, and the Workforce Housing Project um, that is still in conceptual design. So the jumping off point for the Burnside building was um, a, a very limited budget, a very, very small site, and this idea of um, a, an elemental architecture. It was trying to, the clients actually wanted to recapture um, this the, the, the kind of adaptability and um, industry of some of the existing warehouse buildings in the district. And so how do you actually start to address that with uh, new construction? So we looked at a very simple diagram. Um, it was actually a, a Corb diagram, one of the very first ones that talked about this kind of elemental frame and how actually a building um, could exist just as the frame. That was what we talked to a lot with the clients was that you know, with technology with the site, with the structural system that we could employ, um, the, the building could actually be just the frame. So the site for this project is actually only a 38 by 100 foot site. Um, it's along East Burnside. In the 1920s, um, Burn, the city of Portland widened Burnside to allow for increased traffic flow. But the result was that they essentially carved out the ground floor of a lot of the existing structures. And it created this arcade district. Um, it's incredibly unique to anywhere else in the city that you've got this historic context that um, um, this slide highlights a couple of the existing arcade buildings that are kind of closer down on Lower Burnside. So this was actually almost the very first sketch we ever did of the building and it, it kind of looked at a plan on the right with a very tiny uh, site that could actually be divisible into even smaller workspaces, this kind of idea of incubator workspace. Um, and then also an idea about a facade that uh, its longest uh, facade was actually running parallel to the main thoroughfare. It wasn't a, a, a frontal building at all. It was actually something that would be dealt with um, uh, across its face. So how do we actually start dealing with this idea of being able to look up and down that boulevard even though our building was oriented a different way? These are a couple of the images of those historic arcade buildings. So assimilating in, we had the kind of the, the, the basic requirements of the building, some of the basic site ideas, and then of course we found out that the city actually encourages a relationship uh, with the historic arcade buildings. The, the idea being that um, they want to reduce the perceptual width of Burnside. It just feels too wide. So the building engages that arcaded context by stretching out kind of like an accordion across the sidewalk to the north. Once, once we were able to do that, once we were actually able to, to, to stretch the north face of the building uh, off the property line, off the face of the, uh, of, of the underlying building, we started to capture this, this idea of these interstitial spaces, uh, actually a web of, of internal and external spaces that started to rise up through the facade. 
So this is actually the first study model that we actually pulled the front off the building. What happens is in those spaces that creates that web of interstitial spaces, you have the views kind of east and west that connects you to downtown and out to the mountain views. So while you're out there, it, it's clear that you're in a realm that a building doesn't typically occupy, and you you're feel that face of all those historic buildings. So then the, the, the trick was really stepping back and how do we actually express this as simply as possible. And what we, what we looked at was um, a sort of methodology of skinning the building where um, we could look at a, essentially a compressed wall on three sides of the building and then where it, it crosses out to the north side and, and begins to create the relationship with the arcade building, that that whole construct can actually stretch off the face of the building. Um, so the, this is just kind of the series of plans, kind of starting from the ground floor, which um, the glass wall is actually on the property line, and then moving up through the building um, and how those bays start to relate to one another. Um, to, to actually create usable space in the building, the building still needed the, the, the fire stairs, two fire stairs, um, uh, elevator, bathrooms, uh, shafts. So it's a, it's a tiny little 3,800 square foot site. It's, it's smaller than both most residential building lots. Um, and how we actually looked at cramming that stuff into the back corner of the building, um, which posed some structural issues because it, it gave us a, a really twisty, uh, twisty building. But then also looking at the code requirements and, and just skinning everything up as much as we possibly could. Um, we also looked at, you know, it wasn't just the, the north side, but it was creating balance on the, on the south side also, um, where we're going to get a lot of the solar gain. So that south side is actually insulated. It's sort of the idea of the, of the fur hat and the swimming suit. Um, the south side is actually a, a double wall of insulation um, so that we could meet the, uh, the energy code. And also what we began to feel like was it, it began to create a, a, a more of a, um, a sort of figural balance with the north side, where the north side is fully cut away. The south side actually presents a kind of a quieter facade. Um, part of the study was is that when we start projecting out these spaces, is what is the relationship of those spaces? Um, and to a certain degree, we, we, we set up a grid for the facade so that um, we have a, a standard window module. And then how do these projecting bays actually start stitching into it? So we went through a, a long, drawn-out series of, of how these bays would actually relate to one another and the kind of the resulting expression on the facade. And as you can see, these are actually kind of where we got to, and the, and the facade is actually drastically different than that. So these are some photos of the, of the, uh, the sort of the final presentation model. Um, the, the other thing about this project was is that that core concept had to survive um, a, a full design review with the design commission. Um, it was actually had to be approved by city council because of, of our extension across the sidewalk into public space. Um, it survived the centrally side neighborhood group. I mean, it, it was a very drawn out process of, of getting this building approved. Um, it wasn't so much a percentage. Um, that came up actually when we were trying to negotiate a lease because the city actually had to create um, a whole methodology of how you value that space. This was the first project that they had to confront it. Even though it's been happening, they're trying to decide how to get revenue from it. So um, it, was, it was more of a, of, of a design decision about how much of, of the space can we allow to come out over the sidewalk but still allow it to breathe enough so that those spaces are still special. Right. There wasn't actually a, a limit on the amount of space. I mean, once we kind of crossed that stretch threshold, it could have been the entire upper building, but it wouldn't. It wouldn't be the same. It would, we wouldn't be creating these little unique spaces with differing views. And actually, it would have been easier because part of the the, the um, process of getting it approved. The, the major hurdle we needed to cross with the design commission was actually getting them to agree that it was an arcade building. And their definition of an arcade building, the whole facade would have projected and we would have had columns on the, on the ground. So we actually had to do about a 14-stage summary of why this was actually an arcade building. Um, 
So just some of the drawings describing the building. I mean, you can see we, we tried to kind of um, create a, a, as straightforward of a matrix as possible um, to quiet the building down as much as possible so that, you know, as we start to pull this thing apart, that it's still, it's still held together. Um, this was part of the process of actually getting the building approved by Design Commission. Um, and it really looked at um, the, the, the sort of elemental building, um, the, the, the slabs actually just cantilevered straight out, the, the construction system that we used, the post-tension concrete, um, actually worked better when we um, moved the columns in a little bit and allowed, allowed both sides to, to cantilever out. The south side, where it's fully enclosed, where the elevators and stairs are, is actually a, 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 a mirrored cantilever of the other side. And so it really balances out the structural system, allows us to thin up the slab. I mean, the, the project actually died for, uh, for um, financial reasons. And part of the way we got it resurrected is we actually took, we were able to re-engineer it and take an inch out of the concrete slab, take an inch out of the concrete, and take out rebar. And that actually helped. I mean, that's how thin the, the margin was on the project. Um, and these are just some of the final wall sections, um, kind of showing the, the very flat uh, building where, the, where all of the, the, the same layers are, are just basically compressed, and then how they begin to expand and project out over the sidewalk. Um, obviously, a construction photo um, before the skin started to go on, once they got all the structural slabs poured, you can just see the little... Um, projections that end up being those kind of city room pieces. Um, and then there was a whole system of um, so much money got taken out, we had to be very, very careful about how the uh, exterior skin was constructed. Um, the metal panel we ended up with was, I think, I mean, it's like cheaper than, uh, than um, what's the concrete panel stuff? I mean, it, it is... <laughs> It just, we, it's just skinny down as much as possible. So we, we worked quite a bit with the fabricator to make sure that the whole mock-up process um, was tested out as much as we could. There are a couple a series of final images. This is kind of standing in one of the city rooms looking back to the east. You can see the orange facade in the background is that one of the historic arcade structures. This is a view from the sidewalk looking back toward the east and some of those projections. View from above Ron Tom's patio. Um, and one of the things that's happening, and I think as the, as the building will begin to fill up, is um, you know, we had to kind of light this thing as much as we could. But the, the, the bays, the way they're constructed, that we had to actually insulate on the bottom side of the slab so that they actually have a white ceiling. And um, the more light we can kind of get out there, the more animated the facade really becomes. And at it, it kind of night, it really starts to pull apart. The ex so on the underside of those city rooms, the slab is just exposed on the outside. And then there's actually on the upper side of the slab in the interior space is a recess in that slab and frigid insulation is on the interior. So it's and actually then, a third floor, a third up floor. And then on the roof on the rooftops of each city room it's exactly the same detail except the rigid insulation is then on the top and to the exterior. The the profile of the slab as it projects out is exactly the same whether it's um, underneath a habitable space or actually underneath the roof. And we just we, we dropped it down to create a curve and then sloped it out. And so that gave us room to insulate a little bit under the floor, but also provide drainage. I mean, once we actually provided the drainage, we needed to insulate from below in the insulation space. Those are, yeah, those are the last image <laughs> before talking about the next project. Um, so this is a project uh, that we've been working on for about eight months uh, now. It was actually a... a um, a, a joint endeavor between private developer and um, the, P, the PDC. And the whole premise of the project is, um, and it, it kind of goes along a kind of basic sense of sustainability, is how do we make our city sustainable? And it deals with um, high-density uh, affordable housing. And it, it straps across this kind of 
um, median of that what's called workforce housing is about 90% MFI, so it's not fully subsidized, but it's actually the, the kind of working poor, which unfortunately architects have moved into, so um, that's the way it goes. Uh, the site is actually um, uh, up act by the, uh, the Rose Quarter. Um, it uh, is um, centrally located to uh, all kinds of uh, public transportation, the streetcar loop, the MAX station. Um, I think, what's the statistic? It's within a couple hundred feet of 14 different transit, tra transit stops. Yeah. So it's the idea that this, this building, which will have no parking, is sustainable in the sense that um, it, it's, it's conveniently located to both shopping but also public transportation. Just a zoning map, which is part of this presentation. Um, the site is a 10,000 square foot site. Um, it's zoned for uh, high density uh, with a 9 to 1 FAR and a height limit of 250 feet. Um, so one of the mandates of the project was dealing with this idea of uh, family housing in the city. And the, the city of Portland has actually uh, looked at um, how do we actually keep the city viable and sustainable by having um, larger apartments that families can actually live in within the central city. Yeah, and there was a competition, I think it could have been a couple years ago now, for courtyard housing. Um, and, and the core focus was to draw families back into the central city. So we could, took that as, as kind of a jumping off point and how could we actually look at um, some of the uh, objectives and goals of, of that and, and actually look at it on a very small site, on a high density site. Um, so these were some of the, this is actually straight out of the, uh, the um, mandate for the courtyard housing um, and about bringing families back in. And the idea is that also there would be green space associated with housing, um, opportunities for stormwater water management, um, community interaction, and this idea of having um, secure space for children to play. Um, so we kind of looked at just, this is a real, quick series of diagrams of how we actually looked at it by compressing the courtyard, by actually rotating that axis, and having this idea where now we've actually reoriented the axis so sprawl can happen vertically. Um, what it also looks at is potentially just like um, in uh, a, a true horizontal urban condition that you could have this idea of two different buildings. This was the idea of actually uh, bringing the courtyard up to light and view. And then actually looking at what those, what the meter of those neighborhoods would be, and it's uh, basically floor levels. So, is, go ahead. Um, in, in thinking about that high density residential and a high rise tower, um, again, this is kind of a, a, a diagram showing taking an, a high rise modern residential building, and this idea of slicing it and creating that space between, which is the courtyard. So kind of looking at, at, at other models of, of high-rise structures, um, what, by separating the building like this, what we're actually looking at now is, is the potential for structural transfer floors, which are, are expensive. But we're talking about a, a depth that's required to actually plant a floor, an elevated floor. Um, and uh, the ability to begin to look at these truly as separate buildings with separate mixes and potential of, of separate column grids. Once you've done that, that gives you an opportunity to actually begin to look at offsetting them so that we can um, look at solar orientation and how we actually get sunlight into that uh, interior space. The other part of this project, particularly because uh, working with CDC and ha trying to meet target residential goals for the city, um, and that's uh, thinking about the in this idea of metrics, and there are a couple of different ways to think about it. Um, affordable housing is typically subsidized on a per unit basis, um, and for this project, because we were talking about changing that prototype a little bit and thinking about it as maybe it's not just units, maybe it's more about residents, so creating a new a metric for understanding what what the end result will be. I mean, it's we got to the point through discussions where the the money is tied to the unit, but the objectives are tied to the people. So 
how do you begin to reconcile those two things? So the other thing that we knew, kind of looking at the strategy of splitting the building apart, was that there was an absolute drop dead efficiency for the building that we needed to achieve. And once we've introduced a tremendous amount of inefficient space, we need to look at how we can make um, the floor plate itself as efficient as possible. So we went through a series of studies where we kind of just took the components of the core that were going to be required and allowed them to shuffle around as much as possible to actually test efficiencies. You can assume efficiencies, but we actually went through and, and tested them and then looked at the resulting effect on the meter or metrics that we'd set up, which was the number of doors, the number of units, which is where the money is tied to, and then the number of people, um, which the social goals are tied to, and then the number of children, potentially, and that would, I can't remember our exact criteria of how we established one child, but I think it was in larger units where you could actually have a bedroom for one child. So I think in the end, we looked at about 30 different core studies over the course of a weekend. Um, very minor shifts, but in, in, in testing and condensing and reworking, um, finding that most efficient core that would work for both different, what we're calling the both different neighborhoods of the two different buildings once you continue that core up. So what we also looked at on the, on the money side of things is the uh, large apartments, which are the social goal, um, uh, they, they achieve the social goal the best, but then the most expensive to build. Um, the small apartments, which um, actually the money is tied to, um, don't necessarily get us that larger social goal of family housing. So what we looked at was how do we actually set up floor plates also to uh, yield large apartments, but also small apartments, and what's the most efficient for each one. So that was part of our study is when we actually looked at which floor plate is also achieving which different goal. So we ended up with a floor plate that was best for the large families and then one that actually was best for the small families. So then what we looked at was, um, kind of going through the system again, was if you take the two separate buildings, the two separate neighborhoods, and look at the optimal floor plate for both large families and small families, you can use, begin to use that, that, that transfer floor, the garden floor, as actually sort of a tuning fork, as a slider in the building, to then look at what are the overall goals for the project. So we went through a series of studies of these again also, about which ones would actually achieve the, the goals for the project. Right, and in thinking about it for this particular site, but also knowing that we were working towards creating a prototype, that any quarter block site in the city, they could employ this idea and, and again, based on kind of the location, meet a different goal for large units for families or smaller units for more individuals. So where we've been um, kind of settling on what that mix was that was going to achieve the targets for the project, we started to look at what the, what the building actually is architecturally. Um, we found this image of an of a, of a office building in London that was, um, the lower half has been demolished to uh, create a, a new office space, and it was kind of a, a captivating image for us. I mean, we're also kind of keeping it in our back pocket for when people say that you can't actually can when you're like that. <laughs> um, we've, started to work through some uh, early models of how that structural system might work, how you actually start to transfer um, the, the columns down from the, from the upper floors actually down through the building, and how you actually transfer. The bigger thing is how you actually transfer the lateral forces down through the building. Um, the, the next idea is how do you actually skin this thing so that it, it, it doesn't become this, this dislocated group of, of, of objects. Um, so we kind of look back at, at sort of the heroic era of skyscrapers, these, these, um, the, the, this kind of relentless continuity. And then another idea of, of how you actually start to, I mean, we always talk about you kind of, you, 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 you get a concept, you get it to work, and then you smack it once and then see what comes out of it. So it was really looking at how do you, how do you take this kind of, um, this, this heroic uh, imagery for, for these tall buildings and then give it a smack. And so it kind of came up with this idea of distortion. Um, that, that wasn't just um, a, a visual or, or a, a kind of surface view. It actually was also an idea of 
how do you begin to represent um, the, the internal spaces of a building when they're relatively monotonous in a, in, a, in a tall building? So what we started to look at was this idea of taking the grid, of looking at apertures for a punched window building, because that's about probably all we can afford, and then how those internal spaces will line up on the, on the exterior. And it got to this idea of, of quiet spaces and active spaces, so that your sleeping rooms would be relatively calm, quiet spaces. The, uh, the living spaces would actually be active. So we looked kind of real quickly at what one of those kind of, um, the, the internal quality of, of the kind of calm space. And then the idea of, of once you kind of set up this meter of, of how you can actually activate those spaces and allow the grid to start to distort. I mean, with the understanding that it, you set it up once for the lower building versus the upper building, and because the mix is going to be different, those spaces are also going to be different, and allowing that to kind of transfer and inform between the two separate buildings, but to still maintain kind of its continuous expression. The, yeah, the interior rendering showing the, where the band's supposed to end up. Um, and then, and then, kind of putting it back together and seeing what what we came up with. And this is kind of where we are in the project right now. Um, the the study models, um, looking at uh, that sort of that, that middle band where the the garden level is, and also the, an idea of that there can be a community room associated with it to foster the the, the larger sense of community interaction in the building, and what that space might be like. And then starting to look at how this building really sits uh, in the context of the neighborhood, which it's a very, very strange neighborhood with, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but a hospital across the street, um, a mental hospital. Um, there's a senior citizen's home. I mean, what's interesting about it is it's all high density. It's sort of high density senior citizen home, high density hospital. Um, and now looking at um, a, a new take on, on a high density uh, vertical building. Um, and this is uh, the, the, the image that, that we're at right now with kind of what that, that, uh, that middle garden space would be. No, the structure is, is internal. Um, we looked at some ideas about sort of a stress skin, but you know, that breaks down when you cut it in half. So um, basically it's, it's, it's all internalized and it was really dealing with um, the idea that we're going to need to do uh, a sort of a commercial window system versus uh, anything close to a, a storefront or a, a curtain wall. Yeah, and so what you're seeing is that the distortion, the distortion on the facade is, is is only relating to the spaces that's behind it. And as you get to up to the two different buildings, um, the spaces shift around and it's it's responding to that. There is there's one enclosed community room that is that's behind where the bands continue, um, but the the outdoor space is completely open too. Yeah. So in that middle zone, the community space is kind of on the right, that room, and then that that's about I can't remember where we settle on about 30 feet, um, which is the 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 opening for the the exterior space. So it, there's actually mechanical mezzanine underneath over top of the community space. What, what we ended up with was um, this, this idea of the mix. And the, and the lower portion of the building is actually set up for um, uh, more bedrooms. It's, it's kind of the family mix, um, with the upper part being the smaller. It's kind of studios and one bedrooms. And the bottom is um, pretty much one bedroom, two bedrooms, and a few three bedroom apartments. Exactly. It is. And so for this site and working with uh, PDC, this the desired mix for this location and creating that kind of blend between the studios and one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and three bedrooms is how we set that courtyard floor. Okay. So. Thank you.